The great German writer Goethe famously wrote in the early 19th century, America, du hast es besser. America, you've got it better. Images of a limitless frontier, economic opportunity, religious freedom, and the dream of reinventing oneself have for centuries lured Germans from their homeland. These Deutsche Amerikaner assimilated into an American mainstream that in many respects they helped create. Immigrants from Germany began coming to America as early as 1608 and they became some of America's most famous icons. Fred Astaire, Gertrude Stein, Elvis Presley, Lillian Wald, Babe Ruth, Levi Strauss, the Marx Brothers, and today about 15% of all Americans identify themselves as being of German ancestry. America's largest ethnic group. Immigrants from all over the world washed up on the shores of New York City. Most Germans headed into America's heartland, but many set their roots down here, including some remarkable architects who helped design the city we see today. But in the late 19th century, one work of art towered above all. In one graceful Gothic swoop, the Brooklyn Bridge, designed by Johann Röpling von Mühlenhausen, lifted the spirits and inspired the imagination of all New Yorkers. John was born in Mulhausen, which is in an area called Thuringia, which is this very like old German hilly forested area that like legends of dragons and knights comes out of, and a lot of castles and dark forests and stuff. One of the reasons why he first came to America was because Hegel uh, sort of inspired him to start a uh, sort of a utopian agricultural society. And he did that. He and his brother Carl and other, other members of the Mulhausen community purchased these roughly 1,500 acres of land in uh, Pennsylvania and started this town called Saxonburg. And apparently the soil wasn't the best in the world and, uh, and John finally did transition back into uh, developing wire rope and building bridges. John was injured uh, really before construction even began. And so Washington, his, uh, his son, took over the, the job of be being the chief engineer. He eventually succumbed to what, what they called at that time uh, caisson disease. And he suffered from it terribly and couldn't walk and was in a lot of pain. And so finally he decided to be sequestered to his room up in Columbia Heights where he watched the construction of the bridge from his window. Then gave all his orders to his wife to actually communicate to the people on site. And she did this for him for years and years and years. Emily Warren Roebling was for her time, I, I like to suggest a revolutionary in that she really uh, essentially the chief engineer in the building of what at the, that point in time was one of the greatest architectural uh, structural accomplishments of the time. She went on to uh, get a law degree from NYU and uh, blazed a lot of trails for women at a time when, uh, when women still felt that their, their place was very, very specified and was determined by men. And, uh, and Washington happily saw that she was, uh, she was worth a lot more than that. We went back for the 200th uh, birthday of John Roebling to Mulhausen, his town. It was one of the first times I'd ever felt any connection with, with you know, my heritage outside of America. The baptismal basin where, where John was, was baptized, the church there is, is still there. And the people in Mulhausen were just so, uh, so nice and so welcoming that it it made the feeling of connection all the more powerful. So it was neat. It was, it was neat to have a feeling of any sort of connection to a place outside of uh, America. I mean, I don't know what we are in the present except for our, our past, you know what I'm saying? So, and, and in a way, at that point in time, cities 
maybe society as a whole just had a lot more of a sense of its, uh, of its connection to sort of like the universe as a whole. The sense that even in the practical there was something spiritual and something that threaded you into the universe beyond just your daily life. The largest influx of German immigration occurred during the 1800s, and many fled for political reasons after the foiled democratic revolution of 1848. Their idea of freedom, wrought in the struggle for social justice, extended beyond the individual. And many fought against slavery during America's Civil War. Another person who carried from Germany the spirit of justice was Lazarus Strauss. Well, Lazarus Strauss was born in Otterberg, Germany, and the status of Jews uh, back in the early 19th century was never secure. And the aftermath of the uh, 1848 experience was such that it did not look favorable uh, for um, ambitious, uh, enterprise and well-educated Jewish families. And so he himself came over to America. And when he saw it could be successful for him, uh, he then brought over his family. The family moved up from Georgia to New York City uh, after the Civil War. They developed a crockery business in the store of Mr. R.H. Macy. Isidore and his brothers were so extraordinarily successful that they purchased the entire department store and built that into the largest store in the city and of course now throughout the United States. I think at the turn of the century, there still was a, an entrepreneurial unchecked quality. There were the robber barons, as they were sometimes called. There were people who simply felt, uh, I will make as much money as I can. And while I don't think in any way the Strauss brothers were shy about the issue that all companies should be financially successful, I think they felt that that was necessary, but not sufficient. And that's what made them different. Oscar, the youngest of the three, was the groundbreaking person of German-Jewish history. The first appointment of a Jew to the cabinet of the President of the United States under President Theodore Roosevelt. Nathan, the second eldest, was a leader both here and in Israel in the formation of health services and the insurance of pasteurized milk being available to poor families. Isidore Strauss was elected as a member of the United States Congress and successfully established the Educational Alliance. One of the great traditions of the German Jewish families was that many of them felt a commitment to the next wave. And the Educational Alliance was really a major effort to help the next wave to assimilate and acculturate to America. There was a kind of irony because when my children were very, very small, they went to pre-primary school at the Educational Alliance. And there was a day I said to my wife as I was walking them the three blocks to their school, I think perhaps Isidore is looking down right now and he's saying to himself, wow, I planned this for the next wave of Eastern European Jews, but I didn't really, really think that my great-great-grandchildren would be walked by my great-grandson to go to pre-primary school there as well. It was part of the tradition. I have always personally loved history. I wanted to see that the legacy uh, the entire Strauss family would be shared with others. And I decided that I would make a small commitment of my time to the Strauss Historical Society, and to which I'm pleased that my son currently serves as chair of the board of directors. 
I think that his orientation toward family is very, very strong. And he felt he would be able to make a contribution. And I think there's something in, quietly in all of us that wants to make a contribution. In the 1930s, Nazi tyranny propelled many Jews, artists, and leading intellectuals to leave their homes in search of sanctuary. Albert Einstein, Marlene Dietrich, Hannah Arendt, Thomas Mann, Bruno Walter, and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Many academics found haven in New York at the New School's University in Exile, which provided many individuals with visas and jobs. As 20th century scholars or 19th century artisans, with their creativity unleashed, their passions unfurled, and their values to guide them, they thrived. And sometimes what they were able to create became a standard of excellence heard around the world. In the beginning, we were all supposed to learn the trade, so to speak. And I did that for two or three years and got an eternal respect for the skills involved, which I tried and could not do. These guys would uh, take a tool and they'd make one bend and that's it. And then I'd pick up the tool to bend this way, that way, that way, couldn't get the goddamn thing right. And uh, so I learned a lifetime of respect for the guys who actually do the work. My name is Henry Ziegler Steinway and I'm known for being old. I think that's about it. I'm the last person of the Steinway name who was fully active with the company all through those years. Henry Steinway was this modest guy in a little town called Zazen in the middle of Germany who made pianos and had a big family. And he thought that there must be a better way. And so it's a typical American story. He bundles them all together and they come to New York they all worked for different manufacturers so they could learn the language. And then finally, they formed the partnership Steinway and Sons. They perfected the piano. There are about 25 patents there that run along about how the piano fits together. And it was known as the Steinway system at that time. William was the prepotent guy, really, as it developed. He understood America and he understood public relations. And of course, they had built this concert hall in 1866 on 14th Street that seated uh, 2,000 people and became the principal venue that all, quote, cultural events took place there. The only <laughs> the sort of funny thing is there was that uh, woman who ran for president a remarkable woman, and uh, William wouldn't let her talk in Steinway Hall because he disapproved of this whole thing, which is sort of amusing. Part of the success of Steinway was there were so many of them. Some of them tried the business, didn't like it. The ones who stayed were a wonderful bunch that continued the business and were willing to work at it. And we've made, it's now almost 600,000 pianos since the beginning. So that's, that's the heritage, really, which I am just a keeper of.
As late as 1910, an estimated 9 million Americans still spoke German. A favorite saying was often heard by those who aspired for the language's preservation. Ehre die deutsche Sprache, denn der Geist ihrer Vorfahren ist in ihren Worten bewahrt. Honor the German language, for the spirit of your forefathers is preserved in its words. Over the last 400 years, German immigrants and their descendants have largely blended into the rhythms of American life. And yet today, cultural differences have again become a source of pride for all ethnic groups. Interest in one's heritage has encouraged thousands to seek out links between themselves and their immigrant forebears who paved the way and made their mark on America. Got German in your genes? You can find information about your heritage at germanoriginality.com. And to learn about what's happening in New York City's German-American community, visit germanyinnyc.org. Making Their Mark is a special project for the German Consulate General New York.